The day you come to God and make a vow, for instance, I say, I want to be coming here by 4 p.m. Look at your schedule. Consider your schedule. Consider, you know, your work life. And then devote some aspects of your liberties to God as windows through which you will attend to the issues of spiritual sacrifices that uh, will commit God to your life. God will begin to take you seriously as a believer of covenant if you decide to set up a spiritual discipline that involves seeking him, that involves seeking his will, that involves inviting him, that involves transacting with him, and you are consistent. In fact, if you are going to start that lifestyle, it is recommended that you even consecrate a, a specific time so that it will be very, very measurable for you. And you will discover that the times you will have encounters from God is going to be consistent with that time you have allocated to service that altar. Now, let me tell you something. When you begin that process, the process is going to bring God into your space. But, it will take time. Because, like I said, when God sees that you are um, consistent and you are serious, you are trying to transact, God is going to set up an appointment for you. And that appointment is based on his own authority. You cannot influence it. You cannot make it shorter. Neither can you make it longer. Now, the point is this. You must bring faithfulness to the table sufficiently until you collide with that appointment. There is no one that serves the devil. No one that serves the thunder. No one that serves serpents that can be as powerful as a man that has a divine altar that is current. No man, no man. And we say this with confidence because we have been around for a while. We just took inventory of our foreign missions for three years. We have had 84 missions in the past three years. 84 missions in the past three years. We entered into communities that have different kinds of spirits, idols, all kinds of stuff, witchcraft, and there was no community that could resist what we brought. And I'm telling you this experientially. So I have evidence to prove that a man that operates an altar, there is nobody on earth that is as strong as a man that operates an altar. We, we've been to cities where the witches pride themselves of being the, the, the most righteous witches on the continent. Yes, they have kept the laws of righteousness in witchcraft. But they were discomfited by the priesthood that we brought. So I'm telling you something that we have proven over the years. So we have an account of 84 missions and there was no ground that was too strong for us. Irrespective of how ancient the altars were. In Genesis chapter 31 verse 13, the Bible says, I am the God of Bethel. Do you know what is happening here? Where thou anointest the pillar and where thou vowest a vow unto me. So there was an altar that was raised unto God. Are you there? There was a commitment, a covenant that was made with God. And God, when he visited, he came with the identity of the altar. He came with the identity of the covenant. I'm coming in response to your altar. I'm coming in response to your vow. I'm coming in response to your steadfast commitment. Now, so this is the second stage of altar building. In this stage, your altar has been able to attract a supervising spirit. You know, we say it's by my spirit. Now, I don't know how long it will take for your altar to attract the supervising spirit, but if you are consistent and you pay the price of faithfulness, it's going to come to pass that your altar will attract the supervising spirit. When the supervising spirit comes, are you there? Are you there? The purpose for which you set up the altar is being achieved. Now, the purpose for the altar is not the altar. The purpose for the altar, like I told you, the altar is an embassy where entrances are negotiated. So you have negotiated the entrance of God into your space. The objective of that is to bring God into your space. When the supervising spirit of your altar emerges, what happens is that he will come not to congratulate you. He will not come to excite you. He will come to give you instructions. You know you were doing some sacrifice, your own sacrifice. You determined what you wanted to do, that you're going to be praying for two hours every day. You pray with your wife and you'll be calling God and telling him that we submit this family to you. We submit our children. We submit our finances. Come and become the steward in our midst. Direct our affairs. You are calling him. You are calling him. I don't know how long you will do that. But the purpose of your doing that is so that this day can come. This day when the spirit, the supervising spirit 
of your altar will now find it pleasurable for him to now come into your space. And I need to prepare you for the consequence of your supervising spirit coming into your space. I need to prepare you for that. Because if you are not prepared for that, you may not know the consequence of an appearing. It is not as if we don't have encounters as believers. Many of us have powerful encounters, but it not translate to anything in your life. You just had sweet dreams, you saw some stuff, you know, and all. It did not translate to anything. The reason is because you were not prepared for the implication of having the supervising spirit of that altar come into your space to address you as an individual. It means that you have secured his attention. It means that he has finally decided to come transact with you. And there were a lot of considerations he put in place before he showed up like that. Just like snails are sensitive. That's how God is sensitive. And God is hyper jealous. And that's why it's only when you have sought him with all of your heart that he will show up. Because if you have not sought him with all of your heart, you still have alternatives. If he shows up, you'll not know why he came. So that's why I cannot prescribe to you how long it will take. But I told you I was in a spiritual exercise. It, it took me 264 days initially to have the supervising spirit of my altar come visit with me. When that supervising spirit comes, maybe you were doing two hours, you fasted two days, you know, you were the one that determined what you did. When the supervising spirit comes, he'll be the one to prescribe to you the sacrifice he wants. You know, you started first. You started, it's okay, I can afford two hours, I'm a medical doctor. I can afford one hour, I just got married, I need time with my husband. We need to go to Cape Town and run on the beach. Yeah. Are you there? When the supervising spirit comes, He's the one that will give you the instruction as to what he wants. What everything you did initially to set up your altar was just designed to attract his presence. The proof that he has come is that he will come with his own specification as, as to how he intends your life to run. Are you with me? Your level of maturity in your work with God is determined by whether or not you know the laws that God has conceived in himself that was designed to run your life. Now, I know what I need to do to be anointed. And it is that supervising spirit that brought that education to me. I, meanwhile, there are different kinds of anointing that God has committed to me. I have the teaching anointing. I know you know that. There are other anointings. And each anointing that is on my life has a law that governs it. You, you cannot be so wise as to understand the details of these matters until the supervising spirit of your altar appears. It is this supervising dimension that gives you the opportunity to have a, an intimacy with God that you can be confident in. Are you there? It is the appearance of the supervising spirit that now commences what we call your work with God. Your work with God is determined by your compliance to the instructions that the supervising spirit of your altar will make available to you. Now, look at this scripture. I am the God of better where thou anointest the pillar and where thou vowest a vow unto me now arise you have gotten my attention you have secured my commitment so i have come to be your supervising spirit first of all the first thing i want you to know is that you are in the wrong place that's what he told you arise get thee out of this land and return unto the land of thy kindred he said you are displaced there was no way that man would have known that he was in the wrong place until the supervising spirit of his altar came and say, you know what? There is no way your destiny can be fulfilled outside of the land of thy kindred. How many of us know how to drive? You are, you are afraid again. Why is there a steering in your car? You see? Are you there? The steering. The reason for the steering is so that you can make corrections. Those, this is your movement, is corrections. Do you know that you cannot be so wise as to know how to arrive at your intended location? What this spirit is doing to this man here is making correction. He said, you are moving, no, but where you are, you moved to is out of range with prescription. So what do you need to do? It's like a steering wheel. If you lack this steering wheel, you will end in the wrong place. You will do the wrong things and you will still be speaking in tongues. Yes, I've seen many frustrated believers among the nations of the world. And I try to investigate the Christianity of our time to find out what is wrong, what is lacking, so that we can provide a solution. It's part of our apostolic calling. And I found out that the average believer doesn't have a supervising spirit. So you can go headlong for 10 years without knowing that there is no steering. Your engine is moving, it's heating, and you are making progress, mileage, but unfortunately in the wrong direction. I've seen people like that in different nations. 
What is lacking is there's no supervising spirit. What he, is, he does is he comes for normal church meetings like this, but he doesn't have any spiritual commitment that will bring God into his space. The first revelation I came to this man was that you are in the wrong place. Do you know how the life of this guy would have been like if he spent another 12 years in this location speaking in tongues? You begin to wonder why God is not attending to him, but he doesn't know that there's a fundamental dislocation, there's a fundamental issue of disalignment that is in place. The moment the proof that your altar has yielded is that the second window opens and the supervising spirit of your altar comes to meet with you. He doesn't come as a friend, he doesn't come as a companion, he comes in the capacity of a master. He comes with instructions. You are going to access the friendship dimension of God if you are compliant with his instructions. Then you can open another corridor friendship. Say, since you are always in compliance with my instructions, then you can open the friendship angle. But the friendship angle does not erase the master angle. And you must be sensitive to know how to respond to him. If he's coming as a master and you bring the pleasantries of a friend, he might withdraw. In relating with the supervising spirit of your altar, your mouth is going to be filled with words of repentance frequently. <laughs> because <laughs> he's trying to teach you his ways. It's just like, Ras, how old is your son? He's one year. All right. Does he know how to walk? He walks very well. He no longer falls when he walks. You see, before you learn how to, we call it a walk with God. Before you learn how to fluently walk with God, you are going to err, not in the issue of sin, not to the issue of fornication. You are going to the air in the issue of obedience and alignment. Because of that, you need to be customary with the procedure of seeking repentance. Repentance is a critical aspect of our work with God. I know you don't know this. I know most of you think that repenting before God is like um, elementary. Mm -hmm. You are not going to go far with God. In fact, that relationship that God is willing to have with you is so sensitive that an act of disalignment can disallow you accessing to the benefits that that relationship can bring. God knows that the, the relationship is a blessing. So he will not give it to just any believer. He will only give it to those ones that have made a covenant with him by self. Not those who are born again. Are you there? Okay. I was on a crusade ground. I, I prayed. The Lord told me what he would do. He told me the things that we do on the ground, gave me the message, I came out and I began to preach. I began to preach and I got excited. And there were things that I and God discussed, which is not for the public. I started sharing it. Instantly, are you still with me? Inst you will know when your supervising spirit leaves you. Instantly he will leave, he left. But you realize that when he left, I knew I still had the anointing to bring healing to people. I still had the anointing for people's ears to open. I said, he did not go with the anointing. It was him himself that left. But he allowed me access to the anointing. So what I did was I knelt down on the pulpit and I stopped preaching. So people thought I was high in spirit and the Holy Ghost was caught, caught up with me. So they, as they saw me praying and kneeling down, oh, everybody is at the... But I, was, I, was, I didn't know what they were doing. I was looking for my supervisor's spirit. That offended him. And I began to repent. I began to repent. I began to repent. And I felt the departure, the departure of his presence. I felt it as a mighty gulf in my heart. And I began to repent and plead with him. A time came and I laid down on the ground. They said, hi, this pastor is humble. This pastor is humble. But it has nothing to do with the congregation. I was just trying to get my supervising spirit to come back. Then he said, okay, it's all right, son. Because I knew that it was possible to go on with the anointing. May you not go on with something that God has made available and, and, and you allow God to live your life. So after the crusade, the person that was playing the keyboard for me now came and said, ah, why did you need another? What, what, what encounter will you have? I said, I, I, I offended God. That is the reason why I met them. Are you there? You will begin to see how sensitive God is. Just a little statement you can make, can make him go. Little insignificant, something that you can even argue and say, what is wrong with this one now? You see, the point is this. If you need a relationship with him, eh, you must be robust in your life of repentance. He's trying to teach you his ways. And his communications are not in words. His communications are in the way he feels. Just like your body has a language. And when you are hungry, there is a way you feel. And that way you feel, it is only you that knows it. If your body wants to rest and sleep, there is a way you feel. So, the, the way your body educates you is experientially. That's how God is going to ex 
educate you. He will educate you not with words, not with language, but with by expressing his pleasure or displeasure as the case may be. You will discover that God can be irritated by a very small thing that as a man, that thing is not an issue. But you are not dealing with a man, you are dealing with, with a spirit. Are you there? You are dealing with a spirit. And many times at the height of, of preaching, at the height of ministry, I felt his displeasure. In fact, the time where people hail you the most, where they say, hey, you are the guy. Most of those times, you have done things that has made him angry. The thing about repentance is that it is a show of the fact that it's not the things he gave you that you want, but it is the supervising spirit of your altar that is your desire. Do you know if God would deliver Nigeria, do you know it would take repentance? Have you prayed for Nigeria before? That God should intervene? You know what is lacking? Repentance. I know this in my own work with God. That it can take just a little thing to, to make him walk away. You must realize that the ways of men are not the ways of spirits. It is in those things that God is sensitive to that makes him snap. If you know those things. Your knowledge of those things is your knowledge of God. The thing you did that made God snap and made him withdraw. When you start knowing those things and you begin to avoid them, it means that you are, you are beginning to know God. You must understand that the mechanical energy that keeps this entire process going is the human attendant on the altar. If, you, if that your altar loses that mechanical energy, it means that you have shut down the entire system. So when, before you start, before you start this journey, tell yourself, I'm not stopping. You need to make up your mind because it's something you will do intentionally and deliberately. You will do it willingly and you will not stop. So the third phase, you begin to see how sensitive God is and how that if human beings are going to work with God, we must be robust on our attitude of repentance. You'll be begging him almost every week. Because of my life of repentance with God, I don't only ask him for mercy when there's an issue. Unconsciously, like when we were driving from Makodi to Jaws, you will hear me say, have mercy on us. <laughs> yes, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. If I hear you pray such prayers, I will know that, hmm, this man has started working with God. But if I hear you say, now I rise in the name of the Lord and I'm trying to gain, I, I know that you are still in yourself. You don't have an altar. Meanwhile, don't get it wrong. Don't get it wrong. We are men of faith. Okay, I don't need to tell you that. But in relating with God, the, um, what I'm teaching you is about relating with God. And the more you know God, the more the capacity of your faith life increases. When you see people unable to exercise faith, it is a proof of the fact that they have no working relationship with God. In our ministry, we have a lot of pastors. There's one pastor. If he lacks salt, he will call me. I say, this thing is hard. Even salt, he can't even get. I'll send him money. He said, Ben, if I call him just to check on him, how are you doing? He said, <laughs> He'll say, This land that we bought for him, how are we thinking that he will build on it? <laughs> Meanwhile, we have not bought land for other people. Then I now realize that if I continue helping him, God will kill me because. I have blocked the opportunity of him knowing God. So I now told him, you know what? When I have needs, I don't call you. It's God I call. But you know the reason why he cannot exercise faith? He doesn't know God. He doesn't know God. Your knowledge of God will make faith natural. It won't look like a risk. If you still see faith as a risk, okay, you have no altar. There is, there, you are not investing consistently to provide the needed mechanical energy that will drive your intimacy with God. Everything we do for him. Everything we do for him. And you know, I have a helps ministry, so my heart is open to giving for people that know me. But I saw that if I keep giving that young man, I will destroy him. And even God too will destroy him. So I now started teaching him the things I do. Then somebody now gave him 7,000 US dollars. He didn't tell me. But if, it's, if salt is lacking, I, I will know. <laughs> it's when I called him and I said, in fact, Something happened. Hey. <laughs> Meanwhile, I was not, I was not, even if he had told me that somebody, 
are not that kind of person that will now receive it. No, 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 that's rubbish. You know what? The more you know God, the more he will restrain you. You will not be capable of wickedness again, not because you don't want to kill people. <laughs> it's because, it's because if there are things you will try, will, you know he will go. So you are constrained. You are constrained. They, they, you are still the ability to cause trouble. You still is retained. But you have been you have been constrained by God. Constrained by God. This constraining element of God's influence on your life is what the Bible calls the narrow path. For you, not everything will be applicable. I know you don't like my talk, but let it be on record that we showed you the way, and it will be your own choice to determine if you want to work with God or not. This is. I hope you know Kogi State, where we come from, is the poorest state in this country. Poorest state. So I went to preach to young people in Kogi State. I told Kogi, I told, I said, my, my brethren, the only way you will, you will see a headway is that you must know Jehovah so that you can have capacity to believe him. The way we came out of the woods is that we did not have any other alternative. We, we knew that it, if it's, it's by God or not part of the reason why you are like this is because you have people to help you. We did not. In fact, the people that were supposed to help us, they were looking for our debt. So it, it now reduced our options. We knew that the only possible <laughs> and God is faithful. God is He will restrain you. He will, a time will come, the supervising spirit over your life the emphasis will be the way you treat your wife. For, for 12 years, he will not even bother. Then the day he comes and say, hmm. so you can make phone call and call other people for two hours and you cannot say hello to your wife. He will leave. Then you say, sorry, sorry, sorry. And then your wife will begin to see the way you are attending to her. She will think that maybe love has increased. It's not, it's not, it's, it's the supervising spirit. <laughs> oh, my auntie is so okay. Like, and you know what? The moment you begin to attend to her like that, first of all, it's mechanical so that he will not go. Then as you start attending, then the love will not start. Then one day he will come and say, I want, wanted you to know that you, a spell was upon you that was going, yes, that, that's what he told A spell was upon you that was going to affect your relationship with you. That's why I became serious about it. I say, a spell? Who cast a spell on me? Should I tell you something, husbands? Some of you have the same spell that was cast on me cast on you, but you are not aware. I know you don't like my gospel, it's okay. Maybe the people I'm preaching to are online. <laughs> a time he will come, and that's, that's of all the sacrifices God requires from people, the greatest he requires from me is giving. I know the pattern. I know how much prayer I pray, and he'll be satisfied. Giving. Giving. We'll just be driving past one church. You say, can you see that church? That hard currency, you are saving. Look for the pastor and give him. It, I don't need to know the pastor. I don't need to know the brother. Even when we bring it, and give, I will not even be the one to bring it personally so that he doesn't begin to have like me. Do you understand what I'm talking about? But I just obey. I just obey. And as I, most of my instructions are in the area of giving. 60% of my instructions are in the area of giving. For you, it may not be the same. Maybe my own is like this because I have a calling in that area in the terms of the ministry of helps. But you see, the reason for the priesthood is that you will keep sacrifices. That's the firewood that will keep the altar alive. Sacrifice. So if there is no aspect of sacrifice you are making available, your life is the way it is because you are without a vow. You are without a covenant. You are without a sacrifice. You have started living life like mundane men. In dreams, God can meet me and say, as you wake up, send so millions to this man. Send two million to this man. Send four million to that. You know why I don't question him anymore? I, I over and over have seen the consequence of those obediences. And you may not know. The secret to anointing is not all of it that is fasting and praying. And don't get it wrong. We live a fasted life. The issue of praying and fasting is no longer a sacrifice to us. Because you know that's not a sacrifice. So you are fasting for how many days? I, I, I just look at you, I think you are unserious. Because the truth is, fasting and prayer is no longer a sacrifice to us. We've been doing it for over, for decades. I was in Ghana preaching. And what was I even preaching? I was preaching about the University of Nebuchadnezzar. 
the supervising spirit of my altar came to me and said to me, you must make a comment about miracle money. You were there? Were you there? And I began to. I made a passing comment about miracle money. Before I came out of the place, the thing was spreading everywhere. And people began to attack me. Then I went back to my altar and said, this thing you say I should do, it has generated serious problems. He didn't answer for some time. I kept on. When he answered, eventually. He reminded me of 2009 when I went to Malawi. And in my sleep, he told me that you are one of the fathers of the African revival. All right? So when he came, he now said, you know, I told you this. And part of the role you are going to play over the continent of Africa is to be my light of truth. He said, that persecution you are crying about is part of the signs of your fatherhood on the continent. So, the persecution became a thing of joy. That, hey, this is a good thing. You know, the Bible says, it was Jesus that said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Money belongs to Caesar. So, that miracle money in your account, on is, is extra scriptural. It, it makes God, it paints God in the light of a thief that breaks into the storehouse of Caesar to spoil his goods to give to people's accounts. That's not how God gives money. Every effort that involves money is supernatural, it's not a miracle. God can release favor upon you and you do something and it will produce something. And you will know that it, it was with ease because God was with you, but you must do something in order for that supernatural thing to happen. Are you saying what I'm talking about? And it doesn't, we are not, God brought us up in families where Christianity had taken root. We have a responsibility to the body of Christ to bring the truth at any cost. The supervising spirit of your altar will tell you to do things that will make you look controversial. If you want to be in the good books of everybody, it means you achieve that by violating your supervising spirit. The will of God is not like the will of man. Are you ready to work with him? I started enjoying the benefits of that persecution. Prosperity is a sign of alignment. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, not standeth in the way of sinners, not seated in the seat of the scornful, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord his God, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaves also shall not wither. And whatsoever he lays his hands upon to do, it shall prosper. It's a sign of alignment. It's a sign that he's pleased. It's a sign that you are up to date in your obedience of him. You consider him your Adonai. Because he can no longer be separated from you because of your life of obedience, he will use you to advertise himself by blessing you. He wants to be pleased. And only people that are intimate with him can know what to do to please him. Thank you for watching. And if this video has blessed you, please like, kindly subscribe, and also tap on the notification bell so you can stay notified and updated on our new videos. And please do not forget to share the link to people so we can bless more people. And most importantly, we want to know how this video has blessed you under the comment section. Don't forget to subscribe.